amendment be agreed to? And I give the call to the member for Paterson. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise today to remind the Turnbull government that my colleagues and I believe in a fairer tax system for Australia. As such, I will not support this government's $65 billion tax cut to big business. My electorate of Paterson is home to several communities that are living, breathing collateral damage of a system where the government takes from those less well off and gives it to those who are far greater well off. A $65 billion, and, and just saying those words, payout to big business is being funded by low to middle income individuals, families. $65 billion drawn from the pockets of some of the most hard-working people in our country, in my electorate of Paterson. Under this budget, Australian families are suffering stagnating wages, rising electricity costs. We all know that too well. And uh, don't you look forward to getting the text to tell you to turn the air conditioner off on the 45-degree days. We'll all wait with bated breath for that alongside record high unemployment and serious underemployment in an economy that has traditionally been characterised by strong economic growth, living standards are the, and in the last quarter went backwards. I'm not sure what evidence this government is relying on to justify big business payouts, but Labor is listening to the experts. And the assistant governor to the Reserve Bank, Bank, Lucy Ellis, nullified the argument that you need a tax cut to drive investment. Where are this government's priorities? We ask again. Labor is committed to helping the people of Australia. We want equality across the board. We want people to have good and productive lives and jobs. Labor believes that budgets are about identifying needs, prioritising them developing good, solid policy responses and compiling a measured and equitable financial pathway towards implementation. In contrast, the Turnbull government budget fails to address some very serious economic challenges. The government has assured us it's meeting the challenges on the jobs front and the wages growth front, but this government has promised the people of Australia many things. And once again, the people of Australia have been let down, seriously let down. Labor believes in ensuring equal access and opportunity for every Australian. That begins first and foremost with a properly funded education system, not this watered down Gonski 2.0 nonsense. It begins with proper investment in infrastructure, in ensuring all Australians have access to information and communication that is so vital to living in a modern world. It is indeed so vital to every facet of business and industry, vital to staying engaged in a global community. I'm talking about connectivity, digital communication and specifically mobile and internet connectivity. This has been an abject failure on the part of the Turnbull government from the very person the Prime Minister, who, when he was communications minister, was the master of all things connected. He uh, was going to create a great internet. Do you remember that one that was going to be faster and cheaper and it was a multi-mixed technology basis and wouldn't it be great? I can still remember that image of the member for Rowinga and, and, and at the time the then communications minister standing in front of the illuminated board pointing out how fantastic it would be. Well, what an abject failure it's turned out to be. Just today, we've heard from the telecommunications industry ombudsman that more than 27,000 reports were lodged with them during the past financial year, and complaints about the MBN have risen a whopping 160 per cent. And I want to share some of the ombudsman, Judy Jones's comments in her report published today. Australians, this is what she said, quoting from the report, Australians are relying more than ever on technology to stay connected, to be informed and to do business. 
It is critical that consumers are able to rely on the services they sign up for. While it is necessary to acknowledge the role of the national broadband network in driving significant change in Australia's telecommunications, complaints have increased across the board. Complaints about services delivered over the national broadband network have more than doubled. This is the Ombudsman's report that was published today, Judy Jones saying this. This includes an increase in complaints about connection delays and reliability issues such as faults. The increase is somewhat to be expected given the accelerated rollout of the MBN, but it is still a concerning trend. There you have it, hot off the press today from the Telecommunications Ombudsman, Judy Jones. Clearly, this is not good enough. It is patently not good enough. It is an outcome fundamentally out of keeping with the priorities that Australian people so desperately want. We need to keep pace with the technology. We want to be connected to each other, not only to our friends and family, but to our business associates. As we see members constantly glued to their phone as they walk around this house, you can only imagine if they couldn't get the internet or mobile communication. And as the member for Paterson, I am extremely distressed to say that I don't have the MBN and I don't even have internet at my residence. We have to rely on a dongle. So there you have it. It is clearly not good enough. And there are so many more in my electorate who are absolutely bitterly frustrated by this failure. Another great fail has been this government's so-called jobs and growth agenda. What a spectacular flop. In the Hunter Valley, home to my electorate of Paterson, unemployment rates hit 7.6 per cent in August. At the time, this was nearly two percentage higher than the national unemployment rate. In June, youth unemployment in the Hunter Valley hit 10.9. As the member for Paterson, I am committed to ensuring that high unemployment rates in my electorate become history. I am committed to ensuring that we identify the barriers that my electorate faces in finding work. I'm committed to ensuring that our communities have the opportunity to create jobs as well as just find them. I demand to know what has the government done to help the battlers of my electorate. I suspect not much. This government has offered tax cuts to big business. This government has ensured tax cuts to high income earners. This government has ensured increased taxes for workers earning above just $21,000 and penalty rates. Let's not forget about those. This government has worked to ensure that some of the most hardworking individuals in our country don't get financial recognition for the service they perform for our community, for the hours that they spend away from their loved ones during what is traditionally family time, for the nights they spend serving, each other, uh, serving others on shift work instead of enjoying recreation themselves or even sleep. Many of the roles that require penalty rates to provide even a modicum of a respectable wage are the province of casual or part-time employees. There has been a move towards casualisation of jobs right across Australia. People don't need to hear it from Parliament House. They're living it every day. Casual workers have minimal job security and work hours even foreign to most people. And we hear about the 24-7 economy. And whilst I don't deny that it does exist, I say to you, when schools operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then we might consider it, but I'm sure that will never happen. While we have young children who need to be educated within a Monday to Friday, nine to three framework, that will be the basis for the working week. It is just common sense. Anything very much outside of those times is not conducive to family time, and we need to be thinking about that more. It is the government's responsibility to address this issue, and they're doing precious little, and I personally don't like waiting around. I was delighted to welcome the Australian Jobs Task Force to Paterson. This federal caucus committee, chaired by the member for Longman, Susan Lamb, is travelling across Australia to address inequality in employment and opportunity. The statistics are undisputed. Regional areas across Australia are suffering incredibly high rates of unemployment and our young people are being hit the hardest. I remind you again, Deputy Speaker, just last year youth unemployment rates in the Hunter Valley hit over 20 per cent and I know you know it well as being the member for Newcastle you share this with I. It is, it is truly distressing. 
That meant that one fifth of our young were looking for work and couldn't find it. This astronomical rate was second only to outback Queensland, which had youth unemployment rates of 28 per cent, almost a third of young people not being able to find work. I fail to see how the government continues to let this happen. A fair go is something we Australians once upon a time were proud of. We were proud to offer it to all, but it seems we are really struggling, and I am struggling to see how this is providing a fair go. During the recent Australian Jobs Force Task Force hearings in my electorate, I heard from young people who were desperate for a job, people who had disabilities so minor they've fallen through the cracks with regards to any government funding or support, but still have so much to offer. Highly skilled and qualified mature age workers who, after leaving employment due to family commitments, cannot re-engage with employment. Their references are stale, their contacts are out of date, but again, they're smart, strong and willing. These people want work. They have so much yet to give, and yet no one will give them a go. It is people such as these who are last on the list when the economic climate is tough. Those who are most vulnerable are struck the hardest. These high unemployment rates reflect the economic climate of the region. Stagnating wages and little economic growth point to an economy that is struggling. And that is squarely the remit of this government, the Turnbull government, who like to constantly remind us that they're the economic maestros in this concert, that like to tell us how good they are at balancing the books and driving investment and driving wages growth and driving down unemployment. And yet, after four years, we're still not seeing any of this. Where is it, you economic geniuses? I ask you, where is it? Another factor driving youth unemployment is the skills mismatch we're seeing right across Australia. Growing industries in my electorate, as in many others, require high skilling, yet in the past year we've seen the constant erosion of TAFE and VET programs. And since June 2014, we've seen over 4,000 apprenticeships lost in the Hunter region alone. It's further evidence of the very great value of these training opportunities that are just being lost. Yet this government's skewed budget priorities consistently leave this out of the equation. The erosion of funding is only reinforcing the stigma that apprenticeships are second class, and this is wrong. There are many skilled, well-paid, valuable, indeed noble crafts and trades that have literally built this country, but your government's not helping training anyone. Apprentices are what the economy needs, and we've said that on every federal government infrastructure project, if we're elected to government, one in ten of those people will be apprentices, and I think that is a fantastic thing. The benefits are twofold. They give our young people jobs, but they also encourage them on a lifelong path of learning. How can a government that is so committed to jobs and growth constantly <coughs> ignore the facts? In 15 years, today's youth will be the leaders of this nation, and the government is not helping them off the starting block. The longer youth remain unemployed, the more their opportunities in the workforce dwindle, and it only takes six months. So someone who is finishing their HSC this November, as many of them who are sitting it right now, only have those precious few months into summer to find a job, and then it becomes exponentially difficult for them to do so. The longer they remain unemployed, the harder it is, but it only takes six months for it to become really difficult and potential employers start to look at a resume and say, oh, you haven't worked for six months, what's going on here? Even though we all know how quickly that time can flip by. The problem compounds and fewer prospects people have for unemployment and income growth. By pursuing such an ill-advised budget, this government is directly diminishing the futures of Australian youth. In Paterson, we're actively working to try and combat this policy void of the federal government. We're doing our own thing, if you like. We're engaging in grassroots initiatives, of which I'm heavily involved. There have been some fantastic projects, and in the short time I have left, I also want to acknowledge Cessnock City Council, who've been running Cessnock City Youth Employment Project. They've been training a small group of people with a great model, and it's a 12-week program the results from the pilot program, five out of the five young people found employment after completing the program. Congratulations to Jane Holdsworth, the Economic Development Manager of Cessnock Council. 
She is doing a magnificent job and she is hoping to roll this model out to other councils all around the country. And I would personally really like to see that happen because I know it is very successful and actually quite novel. In the word of Jane, if every council in Australia put 20 young kids and got them a job at the end of the year, that's over 14 to 15,000 jobs created every year. Imagine if our councils could train 40 or 50 young people. It would be truly amazing. This, this government has its priorities wrong and it is uh, well and truly exampled in the current budget.